Good morning. Welcome. This is the Tuesday, February 20th uh, Regional Transportation Committee meeting. This is your chair, Steve Conklin. And with that, I call the meeting to order. A uh, couple of housekeeping things real quick, because we have a lot of new people in the room. want to recognize Skyler McKinley from AAA Colorado, Aaron Clark from the Denver Housing Authority, and Lynn, Lynn Geisinger from RTD, who is in that empty seat right there. So, <laughs> awesome. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things, uh, especially if you have not been to our meetings before, if you parked in the garage downstairs, this is your hero. He's got the parking ticket to get you out. So I would encourage you to grab that. Uh, we have coffee and refreshments in the hallway. Also, restrooms are down that way as well. So with that, uh, we will move ahead to public comment if we have any. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Give it a second. But I do not see any hands raised online or in person. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Papsdorf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just because you let me know that you might leave a little early today before the meeting's over, I wanted to take an opportunity to thank you for your service as chair of the Regional Transportation Committee this past year. This is <clears throat> Chair Conklin's last meeting um, at the RTC. will become, as of March, the past chair of the Dr. Cog Board of Directors. Um, and I think ending an election, we expect uh, Wynn Shaw to take over as chair of the board and likewise the chair of the RTC starting with the March RTC. So thank you very much for your service. It's been a pleasure working with you as chair on RTC uh, and we really appreciate your service to this group. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'll take just a, a brief moment because I do need to leave early so won't have an opportunity at the end of the meeting. Uh, this has been great. It's, it's been just a wonderful experience, as has sharing Dr. Cog. So thank you very much and, and wish this group well moving forward. Uh, I unfortunately do have a funeral that I've got to get to, uh, so I will be leaving before the meeting is over unless we move really, really fast. So we'll see. With, with that, <laughs> we have a goal. Uh, with that, I will call your attention to the December 19th, 2023 uh, Regional Transportation Committee meeting summary, attachment A. And we will move into action items. Our first action item is the Transportation Improvement Program Policy Amendments. Josh Schwank, Senior Transportation Planner, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, Lauren, I just messed up everything you just did. <laughs> Thank you for that. All right, let me scroll down a little bit. There we go. Um, so I do have just a very simple change to our transportation improvement program for you this morning. Um, sometimes projects get listed in multiple places in our tip, in this case, um, this project received Safer Main Streets funding through CDOT, as well as some funding through our general tip call. So it was listed in the document in two places. All we're doing is cleaning that up. So we're moving uh, $10 million total uh, from the Safer Main Streets pool and moving that into the separate listing for the West Colfax Safety Improvements Project. Um, happy to take any questions, but that is the only change for you this morning. Um, and we do have a proposed motion available for you in your packet. Any discussion, questions, or a motion? And if everybody could turn your name sign so it faces me, that's helpful. Because even if I've known you for a long time, I get forgetful. And so do we have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Director Johnson. Do we have a second? Thank you very much. Motion, uh, we have a, a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. And any abstentions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, moving ahead. See, we are rocking. We are moving. Uh, item number five, 2024 Federal Safety Performance Measure Targets. And we uh, have Lauren... Kurtis, I apologize. Lauren Kurtis, multimodal transportation planner here to uh, present. Thanks for being here this morning. Okay. Good morning. 
My name is Lauren Curtis. I'm a transportation planner here at Dr. Cog. Um, today, I'm going to be discussing our safety performance measures and targets. Um, I'm going to start with a brief overview of the performance measures, um, go through a quick summary of some of the work we've been doing, and go through some data and rationale as well. Okay, um, so we have several federal performance areas that we review. Um, each of these has their own timeline, metrics, um, and data. Um, and today we're just going to be going through performance measure one, which is safety performance. Um, for this performance measure, we set targets annually. Um, the others we reviewed last year, so we won't be going through those this year. Okay, um, so just of note for um, our performance measures, these are all federally prescribed. So um, something to keep in mind as I'm kind of going through these definitions here. Um, the area for this performance measure is all public roads in the Dr. Cog MPO region. And the data that we use for these are, um, it's provided by CDOT. Um, and then within this, we have five performance measures that we look at and set targets for. And that includes the number of fatalities, the rate of fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles traveled, the number of serious injuries, the rate of serious injuries per 100 million vehicle miles traveled, and the number of non-motorized fatalities and serious Okay, how about now? Okay. Um, <laughs> somehow it muted itself, so. <laughs> it knows that Doug's the boss. <laughs> um, so how we calculate these targets is with a five-year rolling average and we use five consecutive um, data points. Um, the federal guidance for this tells us that we should be realistic and achievable, um, not aspirational, but there is no penalty to Dr. Cog um, if we don't meet these targets. However, we can expect some additional scrutiny in the planning process um, with, during the four-year um, certification with our federal partners. So this will be the seventh year that we set these targets. This is a little bit of an overview of um, where we stand in past previous years from 2018 to present on whether we achieved those performance measures. Um, and as a note, you can see that we're still pending for this year, 2022 data. Uh, we're, we're still awaiting that data from CDOT. So I'm gonna go through just some of the things that we've been working on here um, towards achieving our safety targets. I won't read through all of them. They are in your packet for reference. Um, but we've been working on improving collaboration between allied agencies. So we are continuing to host a regional Vision Zero work group um, that's hosted by our safety and regional Vision Zero planner. We are working on increasing awareness and adoption of Vision Zero. So um, in 2023, we put together a strategic update to our Vision Zero plan, taking action on regional Vision Zero. Um, and that's currently open for public comment, and so you'll be hearing about that soon. Um, we've been participating in a two-year Vision Zero community peer exchange with Portland's MPO, Metro. And so last year, we had a couple of Dr. Cog staffers go to Portland for a visit to see the work that they've been doing, and likewise, a couple of Metro staff came here to visit us. We're also working on designing and retrofitting roadways to prioritize safety. So we have our regional complete streets toolkit that addresses safety related aspects of street design and, and incorporates vision zero principles. We've conducted a regional complete streets prioritization analysis to help identify top corridors for investing funds and resources in the region. 
and we're also increasing funding and resources. So our 2024 to 27 TIP includes 207 TIP projects at nearly 435 million to improve safety. And lastly, we're working on improving data collection and reporting. We have a dedicated senior crash data consortium planner that's uh, leading the efforts to inventory our region's needs and issues surrounding crash data. Um, we also have recently developed a regional Vision Zero story map. That's a toolkit for local governments to have easy access um, to area type crash profiles and potential countermeasures. And now we're gonna get into some of the methodology and data for setting these targets. So we align with our plan, our Vision Zero plan, taking action on Regional Vision Zero, which was adopted in 2020. Um, and the principle is that a loss of life is not an acceptable price to pay for mobility. And so our targets are based on the goal of zero fatalities and zero serious injuries with our target year for zero fatalities being 2040 and our target year for zero serious injuries being 2045. And so uh, the targets kind of balance the aspirational goal of zero with the federal requirement that um, these targets should be short term and realistic. Okay, uh, the next few slides are some charts um, so I'm going to kind of walk through what this is because I realize it, it's kind of a lot. Um, so there, these charts are a way to visualize um, like past current and our future desired trends um, with fatalities serious, and serious injuries. Um, so if you look to the left side of the chart, that orange line that looks kind of brown right now, um, that is our observed data. And so that's from 2012. Um, to 2019. The green dots there, those are the five consecutive data points that we use to calculate the targets. And those five points, it's from 2020 to 2024, and it includes two observed data points and three projected data points. And then the blue line is our desired trend line um, to get to zero fatalities by 2040. Um, and so with that desired trend line, we have um, calculated an average of 13 fatalities required annually to meet that goal by 2040. Um, however, uh, with observed data, we do expect that it will kind of jump around that trend line, so it won't necessarily exactly follow it. Um, it will likely kind of jump around. Some years there may be more of a reduction than other years. And we have the same kind of setup here for uh, visualizing zero series injuries by 2045 with our orange observed data. The green dots are those five data points that we're using to average and calculate our target. And then our blue line is our desired trend line to get to zero by 2045 um, with 68, an average a reduction of 68 serious injuries required to get there. And lastly, we have the same setup for uh, looking at achieving zero non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. Um, and for this one, we have an average um, yearly reduction of three non-motorized fatalities required and 12 non-motorized serious injuries. And so here are our proposed 2024 safety targets. Um, just as a note, the baseline is still to be determined. That's because we're still awaiting the 2022 data. And I'll just pause here for a moment to let you kind of digest these numbers. Okay, and lastly, um, we do have um, a lot of things in the works as far as what we're doing here at Dr. Cog to work towards achieving 
um, the safety targets and Vision Zero. Um, so I just wanted to touch on some of these that are coming up in the next year, um, including the update to taking action on regional Vision Zero. As I mentioned, this is a big one and you'll be hearing about it, I think likely next month. Um, we're also exploring a Safe Streets and Roads for All grant. Um, we're working, we're in the very early stages of developing a crash data dashboard. So I think there's been a kickoff for that. Um, and so that's something that's going to be um, developed this year. And also this year, we're working on an update to our active transportation plan. And that concludes the presentation portion. Um, on your screen and your packets, there is a proposed motion, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank any, you. Any questions or comments? Mr. Cook. Oh, yes, thank you. I don't have a question. I just wanted to compliment you on the story maps. I thought they were excellent, just a terrific tool, and I hope they're getting used. So thank you. Great, thank you. Aaron Clark. Checking, testing. Hi, I know it's my Pass first Pass the first meeting. test. Getting the microphone to work is... Um, I just, I'm curious about these targets. Do they get presented to the public as that, as targets in these whole numbers in this way. And the only reason I'm asking that is because we got all of this lovely context around it's to get to zero by 2040, it's going down. If you're looking at it just as number of fatalities 290, it's like, well, that's, we're comfortable with that number of people. So knowing that that is the number, I'm just curious if it's possible or more outward facing things if it's saying kind of this is the reduction in this year it's minus x number of people <laughs> um, that we to help demonstrate where this is going um, without saying like we're comfortable with 290 and there's not additional context there for others uh, mr rieger you have wanted to comment yeah <clears throat> thank you mr chair thank you for the excellent question director clark first i know you didn't mean it this way i just want to make clear we're not comfortable with that number and i know you i know you know that we're not comfortable with any of these numbers until we get to zero um, but as lauren explained these are very short-term targets these are annual targets we do this every year with five years of rolling average data which for those years are already spoken for so our ability to affect change with these annual targets is actually pretty minimal so it kind of is what it is um, these are federally prescribed to us. Um, that said, to answer your question, a couple things happen. One is that on our website, we have a performance management um, kind of web page where we list um, all the targets, not just safety targets, but all the targets that showed that Lauren showed at the beginning of the presentation um, so that folks can kind of dig into them a little bit. And then if I'm not mistaken, the Federal Highway Administration annually or every so often actually rolls up um, this performance data. The whole point of the federal transportation performance management framework under federal law is to actually take all of this nationwide, kind of roll it up. I believe they do a report for Congress um, and actually show how the country is doing in terms of these various performance measures. Now, obviously, every, every place is situated differently in terms of their targets and their rates, but FHWA, the Federal Highway Administration, is trying to get a sense of just you know, how, how these targets are being implemented and how it's going across the country. You. Um, I guess my question, my follow-up question uh, is not necessarily about this directly, but it, it is about how do we communicate to the public because infrastructure is only part of it. Driver's behavior is a significant component of this. And so as uh, we're talking about 290 lights, this is significant and everyone has a role to play in this. And so perhaps not for this meeting, but I would love to learn more about the outreach efforts and how to get the public to in essence buy into this goal of we need to reduce 13 fatality. Thank you, Commissioner. Hey, do we have a motion? Guzman. I don't know. Oh, there we go. I move to recommend to the Board of Directors of the 2024 Safety Targets for the Metropolitan Planning Organization area as part of the federal performance-based planning and programming requirements 
and adopt the horizon years of achieving zero fatalities by 2040 and zero serious injuries by 2045. Thank you, Director. Second. And Commissioner Hulkins, a second. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. And any abstentions? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. That was great. Moving ahead to item number six, the Transportation Advisory Committee special interest seats, and we will hear from Jacob Rieger, Manager of Multimodal Transportation Planning. All right, good morning, everyone. I don't have a presentation today, so that will help this item move faster, um, but it is important, so I want to, I'm gonna scroll down here a little bit. So this is in your packet. This is just the staff memo in the packet uh, for reference. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so on our transportation committee, uh, transportation advisory committee, which is comprised primarily of local government members um, and other stakeholders, a big component of our transportation advisory committee, just like this committee, is what we call our special interest seats. Um, these are subject matter experts in areas relating to transportation um, that help us do our work. And we have several uh, special interest seats on our transportation advisory committee. Um, through updating our committee guidelines last year, we uh, made some changes to our special interest seats, um, actually added a couple. Um, so we now have had two um, seats in particular that we have been trying to fill, um, given that they are new seats. So as is our standard practice, whenever we are trying to fill a special interest seat on one of our committees, uh, we did do a competitive kind of call for applications, a competitive solicitation. Uh, we were trying to fill the seats for our, what we call our non-motorized or active transportation special interest seat, uh, which was a seat that was formerly part of our transportation demand management. It was a shared seat, so we broke it off into its own seat. Um, and then a new seat, um, an equity seat, um, new to transportation advisory committee. So both of those seats we were trying to fill. Uh, we did a candidate solicitation. Um, vetted candidates, um, and we are recommending the two folks that you see um, on your screen today to fill those seats. Uh, for the equity seat, it's Angie Rivera Malpietti, who I know many of you know, uh, former RTD director um, affiliated with Northeast Transportation Connections. Uh, we think she'll be a great, a great addition to the Transportation Advisory C Committee, representing the equity perspective, which again is something we've not had explicitly before. And then the other seat, the non-motorized transportation seat, several really good applicants for this seat, uh, went through a vetting process on this seat, uh, recommending a gentleman named Brad Rivera, um, who lives in the Central Park neighborhood, has served on the City of Denver's Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committees, um, has done a lot of neighborhood kind of organizing advocacy work to build um, non-motorized connections in Central Park uh, to Aurora, Commerce City, and the rest of Denver. So we think these are both great candidates. Um, this is coming to you today as an action item. So let me show you that motion language. Uh, so the recommendation is to move to approve the equity and non-motorized uh, transportation special interest seat member appointments to the Transportation Advisory Committee. I will finally point out that this is the one thing that the RTC does um, that does not go to our board of directors. And the reason for that is because this committee functions as our Metropolitan Planning Organization Committee, um, bringing together our primary stakeholders. Um, and this relates to our MPO work on our Transportation Advisory Committee. So this is something that you will approve directly. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions, comments? A motion. Uzek, so moved. There you go. Thank you, sir. Second. Second. Director Wheel, thank you very much. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay. And any abstentions? Thank you very much. Great. With that, we move ahead to the discussion items. Our first discussion item is Corridor Planning Pilot Program Update. Nora Kern, Sub-Area and Project Planning Program Manager of Dr. Cog, the floor is yours. Thanks for being here. All right, thank you, Chair. Um, so my name is Nora Kern. I manage our Sub-Area and Project Planning team. And today I'm just giving a quick update on our pilot <coughs> corridor planning program. Um, so just a, a recap or a refresher for those who um, have missed some past or are new to the, new to the committee. Um, our quarter planning program was piloted. We started this about, um, about a year ago, and the focus of this program is to advance the projects and priorities that are identified in our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. 
And specifically, it's focused on helping advance planning on the corridors that are called out in that plan. So on the left side of the screen, you can see a map of those corridors. They're also available on our website. Um, and our focus is really a lot of these corridors are regional. And so recognizing our role as a regional convening planning agency, um, really kind of helping the region advance some of the work on these corridors where um, it, it makes sense. So we did start this pilot in 2022 um, with a selection process. We selected the Alameda Avenue corridor and the South Boulder Road corridor for our first two for the pilot. So I'm just gonna give you a real quick update on kind of how it's going. Both plans are about six months in, so we've, we've gotten um, a little over halfway on each project. So on Alameda Avenue, this corridor is identified as a future bus rapid transit corridor um, in the 2030 to 2039 staging period. So it's a really important corridor for the region. Um, it's, it is a tricky corridor because it, as you can see, it's 14 miles from Wadsworth in Lakewood um, through Denver, past Glendale, out to Aurora, to the R-Line and Sable Boulevard. So really long corridor, a lot of different things going on. We have decided to break the corridor into six segments to kind of to break down it into a little bit more bite-sized pieces. Um, so we've been working closely with all the cities and then CDOT and RTD on this project. Um, and our two consultants are Felsberg, Colton Ulovig, and Nelson Nygaard. So just a quick uh, overview of, <clears throat> excuse me, of the um, schedule for this project. We're, like I said, we're about six months through. We have completed kind of a thorough review of is existing conditions and background um, data review. We had a first community engagement phase to really just talk to a lot of folks about what the priorities are for this corridor and what the current issues are along the corridor. Um, we're now finalizing our vision and goals and starting to develop draft concepts. So we expect to go back out to the community this spring to see if we're on the right track with our concepts and then um, hoping to develop our final corridor plan over the summer. Um, a couple kind of big uh, priorities have emerged through this, this process, and I will note this is really a high level, I would say, first step study. We, we anticipate additional planning efforts will um, follow on this quarter, but there hadn't really been a quarter-wide study, so we wanted to kind of get the ball rolling. So a couple of those priorities are, of course, connectivity along the corridor and across the corridor for all the communities. Safety, it is on our high injury network, so reducing crashes is uh, very important. Um, improved transit, again, as we are kind of looking ahead towards how this might fit into the bus rapid transit network, starting to have some of those conversations. Um, accessibility um, and mobility, making sure everyone can use this corridor safely um, and conveniently, particularly those um, using mobility devices or walking or biking. Um, and then last, vibrancy. You know, there are a lot of really important cultural centers along this corridor, so we want to make sure that we are embracing and celebrating um, those different communities as, as transportation projects move through. Um, so our second corridor um, is a, a little bit smaller in scale, but really important as well, and that is the South Boulder Road study, um, or corridor, sorry. We are, we're looking at the South Boulder Road corridor from um, Broadway in Boulder, kind of through where it's actually called Table Mesa Drive, and then through um, unincorporated Boulder um, County to Lafayette and Louisville out to um, 120th. Um, so again, a lot of partners on this one. Um, we're working with Farron Piers and Kimley Horn. And some similar priorities. This is identified actually in the 2040 staging period, so a little bit farther out. And it's identified as an enhanced uh, transit corridor. But um, based on the conversations we're already having with everyone, you know, we are seeing a lot of um, need to improve bike connections, particularly through the Boulder County section, looking at pedestrian safety and crossings. Um, several segments of this are also on the high injury network. Um, it's both a regional corridor, kind of a connecting corridor for Boulder County, but it's also a corridor that, particularly in Louisville and Lafayette, is kind of operating like a local street, so kind of balancing all those different competing needs. Um, timeline here, um, actually, I, it's, since uh, putting this presentation together, the green era can move down one block. We have just wrapped up um, our existing conditions analysis and our first phase of community engagement. Got a lot of great feedback um, in Boulder County. 
and then we're kind of developing our potential cross sections and project ideas. Um, and then we'll be going out again in spring to kind of run those by the public and make sure we're headed in the right direction. Um, and then this one's on a similar time frame. We're hoping to wrap up this summer. So we have, I think, you know, this was a pilot program and um, as I'll mention here in a second, our quarter planning program has been formalized as a tip set aside. So it's been a really great opportunity to kind of test test drive this um, these types of projects, and we're now excited to be adding a couple others in in the coming months. Um, but I think it's really highlighted, you know, we do it. These regional corridors um, really lend themselves to our role as a as a regional planning agency. Um, it does create some different challenges, you know, particularly in community engagement. It takes longer when you're working with multiple jurisdictions and don't have a necessarily a built-in constituency. Um, and then we're also really starting to think about, you know, we, of course, can bring people together and help with some of these initial planning projects, but ultimately we're not going to be building anything, so we need to really be making sure we're connecting to um, the next phase of these planning projects and who's going to be taking the lead. Um, so like I said, this has been formalized in the 2024-2027 TIP. We have um, about $3 million um, over the next four years. We have split that into two two-year cycles. So our first two quarters were selected last fall, and so that will be a safety Vision Zero study of Sheridan Boulevard, and then um, kind of an alternatives analysis looking at the East Colfax BRT extension out to E470. Um, so both of these were working on scope and an IGA with CDOT so we can move forward. Um, and then just to note, we will have another call for projects for the second two-year cycle in, 20, in summer 2025. So that will be upon us before we know it. So with that, happy to take any questions. Do you have any questions, comments? Director Ward. I guess I have a question. Um, for the Alameda Court, Alameda, um, how did we, how did project only get scope from Wadsworth out to the R-Line station by five and not, um, let's say a little further west on Alameda to let's say W-Line is um, at Federal Center State, connecting with that um, Common Spirit Hospital now, but I think. Yeah, that's a great question. So the original limits of the project came from the regional transportation plan, and that's how the project is listed. <clears throat> Excuse me. But um, we have heard a lot, particularly on the transit piece, that it is really important. I, I don't think Belmar is necessarily a logical terminus for a bus rapid transit route. So um, it's looking like our recommendation would be, you know, I think in the next phase of this project might be doing a more detailed transit study, and I anticipate that study would look, you know, at extending potentially out to the Federal Center um, station. As you said, I think that's a much more logical terminus. So we were considering that, even though it's a little bit farther west than what's in the, the regional transportation plan. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Oh. Dr. Shaw, sorry. Thank you, no problem. Um, along with uh, transportation, you had mentioned vibrancy, and that sometimes involves uh, housing and commercial development and that kind of, or, or redevelopment. Um, is there a way that this plan can kind of have components tucked into it for those uh, for housing and commercial redevelopment? Yeah, that's a good question. It wasn't, I think, you know, initially within our scope, but we have heard, like you said, from certain communities, I think particularly in West Denver, um, just feeling like it, there's a need to, to think about the corridor a little bit more holistically. So we're certainly working closely with the city of Denver and, and Aurora and Lakewood. And so I think that's probably where we would, we would look if there are recommendations that are more in the land use or development side, we'd want to make sure they align with what the city's thinking and make sure they've heard that input. I think in the West Denver case, they're working on the West, um, or they've just completed the West, you know, neighbor plan, the plan for that area. So I think um, there's a lot of synergy. So we'll definitely look to kind of complement what they're already doing and then and add to if necessary. But probably our plan will be mostly transportation focused. Fantastic. Thank you very much for the presentation. We yeah. appreciate that. Thank you. We will move ahead to the federal greenhouse gas performance measure introduction. Uh, Alba Fidel Sanchez, Regional Transportation Planning Program Manager. 
Thank you for being here. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we'll be taking another bite at the Federal Performance Measures Apple this morning. Um, before I get started, I do want to recognize staff from the Colorado Department of Transportation who are here to assist, support us. Um, CDOT has been a phenomenal partner in our federal highway, federal performance management efforts, so I want to recognize them and thank them. Um, and if there are any technical questions that come up or questions I can't answer, I will be leaning on them for support. We've already seen this slide presented by Lauren earlier. Um, each of these five performance areas came into place beginning in 2017, and since then um, they've come online in various ways with different data, different reporting requirements, different timelines. They are broken down into the two federal DOT agencies, so Federal Highway Administration, Federal Transit Administration. I will be touching on PM3, as it's called this morning. Um, it is a new performance measure for us, for the state DOT, for MPOs. Um, PM3 is our largest, most expansive performance area. It actually includes four sub areas, and then there are performance measures within those sub areas. And so we are talking about a new performance measure under what is currently called the travel time reliability sub area, um, but it would be the percent change in tailpipe CO2 emissions on the national highway system. So for each of these, there are different data pieces that we're looking at. There's different reporting, um, different timelines for how we adopt, um, whether we can support the state targets or support or set our own for the region. Another overview slide, since this is new for all of us. Um, in terms of the data that we're using, the area that these targets will be set for, it is all mainline highways on the interstate and non-interstate national highway system. There is a slide following that shows what that actually looks like in the region, so you can get an idea of what that is. Um, I will note, note the definition of mainline highways doesn't include those on-ramps, connecting ramps that connect interstate, so we are really just talking about through travel on the interstate, non-interstate national highway system. The data we're using comes from the Federal Highway Administration. It includes CO2 emissions factors and fuel sales data. Um, and then that gets combined with vehicle miles travel data that we have in-house. One performance measure is the percent change in on-road tailpipe CO2 emissions on the national highway system relative to 2022. So 2022 is what we'll be benchmarking our targets from. And this will be a percent change target when we come back before y'all later this year. So um, whereas the safety targets you just saw were numbers um, or, or decimal place numbers, um, this will be a, a percent value. The calculation um, looks confusing. It essentially is just the emissions on the national highway system in the current year subtract the emissions on the National Highway System from the reference year, which would be 2022 for this first effort. We divide that by the emissions on the National Highway System in 2022 to give us a decimal value, and then we multiply times 100 to get that percent change. In terms of federal guidance, this one's a little different than what you heard on safety and what we typically show for our federal performance measures. Um, targets must be declining targets. State DOTs, CDOT, MPOs, Dr. Cog can still set targets that make sense for our region, make sense for the state, but they do have to be declining targets. Um, the other performance areas, performance measures that we typically bring back before y'all don't have this requirement. They can just be short-term realistic, um, trend lines with the data, improvements to particular projections, but in this case, there is a requirement that we show a decline from 2022. As with many of them, we can support CDOT state targets or we can set our own for the region. There is no financial penalty or funding restriction for either us or the state DOT, um, but when we get to our four-year certification process, there could be just some additional scrutiny in terms of our performance management program. So I promised I would show you what the National Highway System looks like in our region. Uh, the dark blue lines are the network that we'll be looking at when we set this target. Um, overlaid behind that, underlaid, I guess, is the gray roadway network that just exists in the region. So every other roadway that exists in our region, um, we are only looking at the blue, dark blue network to set these targets, travel on the national highway system. So we are not looking at um, emissions for the region. We are looking at emissions for the MPO boundary on the national highway system. In terms of Dr. Cog requirements, we will have 180 days after CDOT has established their targets. Our ultimate deadline will be September 25th of this year. So we'll be coming back before y'all later this year with a recommendation to the board, further conversations on what target setting makes sense for us. 
we do have to establish these through resolution. That's our standard practice. Um, our, our board chair, after a board has taken action, always does sign off on a resolution that indicates and notes those targets, and those get combined with a letter and get submitted to our state and federal partners to show our compliance with these efforts. Like I mentioned, we can support the state's target or set our own for the region. One idea that's been thrown out there in terms of federal guidance is we can use our share of the state's VMT as a proxy for emissions in the state if we decide to go that route. Coordination with CIOT is encouraged, um, and there are no significant progress determinations. So like I mentioned, there is no funding or funding restriction, financial penalty. Um, when it comes time uh, at the end of this reporting period to check on our progress, there will not be a significant progress determination for the MPO. Some considerations um, as we get into this effort. This is not a new conversation for us in the region. Uh, Metrovision has had a surface transportation greenhouse gas performance measure. We're all now familiar with the state's still relatively new greenhouse gas transportation planning standard. Um, so this is not a new conversation for us, it's just a, a tweak to that. So whereas the Metrovision performance measure is pounds per capita per day, and the GHG planning standard is a reduction level in million metric tons, this one would be a percent change from a reference year um, and declining. So these will be um, considerations we keep in mind as we get into target setting. For some of these short-term targets, we do align them with a long-term aspirational goal that might exist somewhere else in our planning framework. Um, if it comes time and we think that we should be setting our own targets for the region, this could be areas that we look at for that alignment. Next steps include a briefing to the TAC this month, um, and then a correction will be going before the board next month just to continue this conversation. CDOT's deadline to set their own targets for the state will be March 29th. Following that, we'll be coordinating with them um, and the board and y'all on target setting what makes sense for us as a region. And then our deadline ultimately will be September 25th, so you can um, look for further conversations from staff on this effort um, later this year. And that concludes my presentation, Chair. Thank you very much. Questions, comments? Chair Cook. No, no, yep, it is. Um, on the, both this and the safety performance measures, and there's no penalty, but there's uh, the potential or there is added scrutiny. What does that mean? I mean, does that turn out to be less funding? And how do we know it's happening or, or that translate to? So for every four years, um, our federal partners, the Federal High Administration, the Federal Transit Administration, um, certify our planning process. So uh, this will actually be starting later this year. They'll be asking questions, questions of our planning process, our products. Um, in terms of the performance management program, it could just be, um, well, uh, what were the assumptions you used? Um, how would you want to improve your target setting process the next round? Um, how are you incorporating these into other planning products? So you're seeing that. Um, that movement that you're wanting to see in these short-term targets. So I would say it would be uh, conversations formally during the certification process, but we try to build this into our other planning efforts. So we're um, making progress, looking to achieve these uh, through multiple products, planning processes, not just the federal targets we're setting. Perhaps, Ruth. Um, Elvin, Elvin's 100% correct, um, maybe augment just a tad. I think there's also a requirement in the Federal Highway Administration rule that they'll be looking for agencies to um, identify some action plan for getting on track towards the targets as well. So it's not really a penalty. It's, it's more about, I think, to that additional scrutiny. What are you going to do either as an MPO or a state DOT to show that you're taking some actions to get back on track for the targets? I think what's a challenge and an opportunity for us is because the state now has the greenhouse gas emission reduction target in place, we're already doing those things. So I think whatever target the state and Dr. Cog set under this new federal performance measure, we're going to be okay in terms of showing progress towards that. I think the big question for us is how do we, how do we align a federal target with the state requirements that we have under the state greenhouse gas rule? And how do we explain to you, our stakeholders, the public, that we're going to have one target for the feds that's a more near-term target that's only for a limited portion of our entire transportation network and we have a target under the state greenhouse gas emission reduction for the entire transportation system and all travel in the region. And try, again, our friends at the federal level 
have created this issue for us, similar to the conversation you had earlier on this on the federal safety targets, where our our target is zero, but because of the very mechanical and very prescriptive way the Fed say we have to set our federal safety targets the same way now for greenhouse gas emissions, it gets confusing with what we've established for our regional goals. Clark. Thank you. I think you just, I want to follow up on something you had just said there because it makes perfect sense the, the federal regulations and the way that the numbers have to be certainly factoring that and understand all that and why it would be more objective to say that this is not the on-ramps and off-ramps, it's just the through lanes, um, but was curious of where where the idling on on <laughs> on on ramps and off ramps is being you know where that information is being captured so is that part of the state piece or yeah, thank you um, so yes that would be captured under the system wide reduction goal we have under the state's greenhouse gas emission reduction rule other questions thank you very much appreciate your time yeah, we have been rocking and rolling. We are uh, moving into member comments and other matters, unless I put something off there. So, Wynn, you're probably off the hook. You know, that's, that's, I think we may get this done before I have to leave. Uh, member comments, uh, we'll start with CDOT. I'll, I'll start on this one then and hand it over to uh, Commissioner Olgeen and then Commissioner Cook and then um, Jessica and Darius. So we'll give you a quick overview. We just had our meeting last week. <clears throat> which is interesting because usually we have our meeting the day after this meeting, so we don't have a lot to say that's current. Uh, we had uh, we had an opportunity to provide uh, approval of the statewide rail plan. It's on our website. You should take a look at it. It's interesting because as the governor is moving forward with um, a transit in the form of rail expansion, um, that's included in our rail plan. And it uh, talks about not only CDOT's uh, rail plan, uh, but all the other rail opportunities within the state and um, how that fits into uh, going to move forward with increasing rail. We had a grants workshop that was just exceptional. Uh, we have so many uh, requests for grants at CDOT, and uh, we have a dedicated staff that looks to all the components of how you can be competitive with a grant and which grant should be led by CDOT and which grant should be um, led by local governments with our uh, support. So that was a, a very good um, grants workshop, I thought. Uh, we also had a rest stop area report. You know, uh, we continue to hear uh, about how terrible the rest stops are in the state of Colorado, and we haven't put any money into it for a number of years. We started this year, uh, 2023, we started with about a $6 million um, uh, money from CDOT um, to to augment some federal funds we got to start fixing um, bail pass. And then the Pueblo one is um, on this year's um, list to do, but it's expensive. Our, um, our rest areas are constrained um, with funding because we can't do any advertising at the rest stops, and that's a federal requirement. And there are some state restrictions as well. We can't put EV chargings in, uh, that kind of thing. So um, we've been a little bit, uh, uh, I think, um, frustrated <clears throat> in that we hear from a lot of people who travel the state of Colorado that our rest stops just don't match up with the rest stops in adjacent um, states. So um, I think our commission is really dedicated uh, to trying to improve that situation and how we can start moving some more money into that. It's under our asset protection budget, which asset protection is everything under the sun, uh, maintenance and, and uh, surface treatments and all of that. So uh, big competition for that. And finally, from my point of view, one of the most <clears throat> interesting things that happened at CDOT this time of the year is our legislative update. CDOT's uh, looking, uh, looking and tracking 55 bills so far, and it's very early in the session, and there's all kinds of bills that um, will affect CDOT or um, are proposed by CDOT. So uh, you, if you have a chance to look at some of those bills, they, uh, they run the gamut. Um, I'm, gonna, uh, I, I'm going to uh, pass it over to uh, Commissioner Holgey. 
Thank you, Commissioner Stewart. Um, I, that was a wonderful report. The only thing that I will add is that we had a wonderful and full conversation about electric vehicles at our breakfast, and um, we asked CDOT to bring back at the March meeting a very exciting session on myth busting for electric vehicles. And so, um, well, I'll let you know how that goes next month, and if perhaps that might be something that we can bring back to this group. Thanks. Likewise, have little to add except that the uh, rail plan includes also Burnham Yards, and um, that of course is needed for the front range passenger rail planning, but also has so many other components. Um, I think we're going to have a field trip in April. Is that correct? Yeah, to, to look at that. That'll be really interesting. So thanks. Hi, Jessica Mickelbust. I'm the director for CDOT Region 1, uh, which is the Dr. Cog area. So just a few updates kind of from the region level. First off, um, safety. We've got a lot of construction projects, even though it is winter and it's snowing. We've got a lot of active construction on our um, main lines, including several bridges on I-70, um, a truck escape ramp on I-70, Floyd Hill. Um, Six and Wadsworth is starting one of the early action projects. So just please, as you're traveling around the region, watch out for the, the work zones. Uh, we're really excited to report that from a snowplow driver perspective, compared to where we were last year, we're very, we're looking very good with staffing. We have a very low vacancy rate, um, and those staff members have been working their tails off. Uh, they've been in snow shift almost every weekend for the last five or six weekends, and it looks to maybe snow again this weekend. So in between snowstorms, they're uh, cleaning the trucks and then doing safety critical repairs as they can get to them. Uh, so please give them space as they're working to do their job plowing snow on the roadways. Uh, and I believe that's about it for Region 1. We've just got, we've got a lot going on. We released our freight funding um, and made some decisions on some of those things. We've got, there's a lot of grant opportunities floating around. We're working with our local agency partners on several grants. If you are looking for support letters, please feel free to reach out um, to me or one of my staff. And that's all for Region 1. Darius? Dr. Cog included, and it's trying to take a look at, thank you, appreciate that. Take a look at the, um, I've been here so long, you'd think I would get it right after, after a year, but uh, this tra travel survey is very important to take a look at the future of transportation, how people are using transportation system right now. One of the things that it helps with is our um, uh, development of our long range regional plans, both at CDOT and at our, with our MPO partners, our compliance with the GHG gas rule eventually. So I wanted to make a note of that, that that's an important survey. And if folks ask for it, it is a legitimate survey and, and we would appreciate participation in it. So that way we can take a look at the future of transportation in Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and Doug, I hope in, in your veto, one of the lead lines is microphone troubleshooting. So, good. Uh, regional Transportation District. So good morning, everyone. Uh, before I delve into my report, I will yield the floor to the directors that are present. So, uh, Director Buzik. Thank you, Mad Madam General Manager. Um, not a lot for me to report. I, we're having a, a, a retreat this Saturday. The RTD board is having a retreat to talk about a number of things. And I just wanted to give everybody a heads up. A lot of people know in this room about RTD, but there are apparently a lot of people out there that know absolutely nothing about RTD. So just want you to know that we're made up of a 15 member directly elected board of directors, as in taxation with representation. Um, we're, we are professional and qualified transit experts. Our board includes two former mayors, former state legislator, four attorneys, former city council members, community and transit advocates, former CDOT interim executive director and professional engineer, educator and transit advocates, former city manager of Aurora. Uh, and we each represent over 200,000 constituents. That's all I have for my report. Thank you. Well done. 
Hi, I'm Lynn Geisinger. I was uh, the, 20, the 2023 chair of the RTD board, and this is my first RTC meeting, so I'm looking forward to learning more. Um, following up on, on uh, Vince's uh, introduction there, we are likewise following a number of um, like CDOT following a number of uh, items in the legislature now, two of which that have been introduced would fund, uh, give some funding for our zero fare um, program for ozone in the summer months or months and uh, our pilot program for uh, zero fares for youth, which is proposed to be statewide. Um, we are also looking at uh, potential legislation following up on some of what uh, Vince said that has not been filed, and um, uh, this year, at the end of the year, we will lose our Tabor waiver for um, the base system tax, uh, which is six tenths of a cent. Uh, so that's taking uh, uh, a lot of consideration, and uh, we're looking forward, as Vince said, to our retreat and, and uh, looking ahead at our goals for the year. Thanks. All right, thank you very kindly. I see Director Guzman, our alternate here. He just gave me the nod. He has nothing else to add. Okay, very well. So uh, thank you very much, Directors, for that report. I will just delve in some other elements that are more or less of an operational nature. Last report yesterday, our RTD Boulder Station Lobby reopened after it had been closed for a period of time. You may recall that we were doing some remediation work. After going in there, we found out that we needed to do some work with the duck. D-U-C-T, not D-U-C-K, um, uh, in reference uh, to the ventilation, the high-powered fan. So I know people are like, what is happening there? But really, as we look at supply chain and we went in what we needed to do, uh, we're in a better place now, uh, considering that we shouldn't find ourselves in a precarious position such as that. Um, what I would like to add, recognizing um, that last year we had Director Kate Williams that served here as a member of the RTC. Uh, due to her health status, she um, basically resigned from the RTD board, and Mayor Johnston appointed Jamie Lewis, who some of you may know is an advocate in the community uh, focusing on disabilities and also uh, works uh, with the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. This afternoon, the city council will consider his nomination, and if they deem appropriate, he would be joining the RTD board. Um, starting next week on March 6th at noon the um, Microsoft Teams at March 6th at 5.30 at RTD's main headquarters on Blake Street and on March 7th at noon via Microsoft Teams will be hosting public meetings relative to the 2024 service change. These are important as we forge ahead and I reported out um, at our last meeting in December where we're making plans for some critical infrastructure projects, rehabilitation and reconstruction, recognizing that RTD's original light rail line opened up on October October 7th, 1994, this agency has not yet taken ever a comprehensive rail reconstruction program. We've done tar targeted segments of rail that needed uh, some replacement. Also, um, I'd like to share with you all that as we look at our subfleet um, of our vehicles that are zero emission, um, being our mall ride specifically, we are transitioning those seats from fabric to vinyl. I think it'd be a better situation for all involved, recognizing that there's a uh, high level of um, work that has to be done to keep those in a state of good repair and clean. Uh, we commenced on our light rail vehicles some time ago, and that's going to be cyclical in the sense that it takes a lot of time to change those out. Also uh, wanted to share recognizing that RTD is a partner um, along with CDOT and City of Aurora and City and County of Denver as it relates to the Colfax BRT. Uh, there is a community open house taking place on February 28th at five o'clock at the Carla Madison uh, Rec Center. There'll be updates on the project, the design, construction, and small business opportunity. And then as we talk about zero emission, and I know everybody gets goo goo ga, -ga over that and I don't want Did I touch it? Hey. <laughs> Sorry. You guys missed my friendly little barb that I didn't want to be the skunk at the garden party. Um, we are very well interested in low and no zero emissions, but one thing that's quite certain, having been in this transit space for a period of time and engaged in a multitude of conversations with low and no zero emission, um, 
a fact for you all. Like 10 years ago, there were 11 original equipment manufacturers in the United States, meaning those that manufacture buses. Today, there's only two. And recognizing the complexities when you are procuring vehicles and there's various specifications, um, oftentimes transit agencies make uh, deviations to a standard bus, recognizing that RTD uh, has uh, a different topography than the city and county of San Francisco, recognizing that RTD has uh, different weather patterns than the Coachella Valley in Southern California, we do need to make some deviations. But with that as a backdrop, discussing these different elements and buy and build America, uh, the original equipment manufacturers that participated, which is Gillick and uh, New Flyer Industries of North America, that they've had a hard road to hoe when people are only procuring five vehicles and there's been some deviations to that. So I had the pleasure on February 7th of uh, going to the White House, participating in a round table on clean bus manufacturing we had um, representation from the Biden-Harris administration, the senior advisor of climate. We had the Federal Transit Administration, um, nine transit CEOs, including myself, as well as American Public Transportation Association. And what we talked about was how can we support our original equipment manufacturers as we look at procurements and things of the like, oftentimes, um, we would not, we being public agencies, would not pay for vehicles until we receive them. And there is a lot of risk that the OEMs take on. And so we talked about progress payments. What can we do for standardization? Uh, a white paper was just released just the latter part of last week. And then the Federal Transit Administration issued a Dear Colleague letter giving transit um, agencies um, some guidance as relates to what we could do moving forward with procurements if, in fact, we were to take part in a joint procurement, uh, you will get preference and things of the like. So RTD is currently working with its partners being WSP um, on a facilities and fleet transition plan. And I put the emphasis on facilities because of zero emission buses for not if you don't have the appropriate facilities and infrastructure to uh, take care of that. So um, with that, I will, oh, Director Geisinger made mention of SB 32 um, in reference to um, methods to incentivize transportation. I, along with Director Geisinger and Chair Davidson, um, actually provided testimony before the Senate Transportation and Energy Committee on February 5th, and happy to see that that made that out, recognizing the benefit um, that zero fares for youth in particular will bring, recognizing it gives you the opportunity to create a transit um, customer for life in reference not only to being a good environmental citizen, but also providing opportunities for those that weren't born on a level playing field. So with that, I yield the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Director Silverstein, for RAC. Now I need help. Thank you. Teamwork makes it work. <laughs> I know. How's that? Um, well, first, I, I would just like to um, one more time thank um, Steve Conklin for his leadership at RTC. I just, I'm, I, I love to watch uh, leaders uh, run a meeting, and uh, Steve is uh, flawless at his work. So. Congratulations. Huh? <laughs> it's been fun. And so we'll see, we'll see how I, I think we do it next month with our new chair. It's always going to be some practice, but <laughs> no pressure, no pressure when. <laughs> so again, thank you. Um, RAC is active in the legislature this year, uh, more so than um, I think in, in previous years uh, in its history. Um, two things to note, um, we'll be uh, authoring a bill to um, uh, allow for local government flexibility in adopting vehicle idling uh, restrictions. And so there's, there's a state uh, kind of model ordinance that uh, allows for local governments to adopt certain idling restrictions but prohibitions uh, in other areas. And so we'll be looking to, uh, to allow, to, to remove that uh, um, restriction on local governments to adopt uh, tougher idling ordinances. And so that would uh, improve air quality in, in you know, our region. And the second is a, um, a funding initiative so that we can um, uh, get additional resources for our incentive dollars for, um, uh, for lawn and garden equipment. So um, state monies to help in the transition of, of gasoline equipment to electric. And then um, on that note, we have um, our lawn and garden uh, rules were adopted by the Air Quality Control Commission uh, last week. 
uh, RAC, uh, along with the state, um, offered proposals to the Air Commission to restrict the use of gas-powered lawn and garden equipment in the summer months in our high ozone season. And uh, certain restrictions were approved. Some of them were not. But that really requires state and local agencies to go electric in the summer months and to purchase equipment and, or, or just uh, put off the work that um, needs to be done with gas-powered equipment with some exemptions. So that, that will help remove a, a significant emission source from our region uh, beginning in 2025. And then um, I, I think that's it. So thank you. Thank you for the kind words, too. I, I don't know what meeting you've been attending, but uh, <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, uh, I talked about the parking passes and being sure you get that from our hero, Cam. I also want to acknowledge Cam. Uh, however well the meetings run, he is absolutely uh, a key part of that. I just really appreciate you as a partner in, 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 in these meetings. Uh, it's been a joy. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, your next meeting is March 19th, and... Uh, Take care. Thank you very much. Meeting adjourned.